If it's Thursday, abortion in America, one year after the Supreme Court ruling that took away the right to abortion in this country, we have brand new NBC poll numbers showing what voters think about that decision and what it means for the future of American politics. Put it this way, it's not aging well. Plus, the White House rolls out the red carpet for India Prime Minister Modi, aiming to tighten ties with India in an effort to contain China. Despite deep concerns about Modi's own commitment to basic democratic principles and human rights. And catastrophic loss. The Coast Guard says the five people aboard a missing deep sea vessel that was touring the Titanic are now presumed dead after debris from the submersible was discovered in the search area deep underwater. Happy Thursday. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I am Chuck Todd reporting from Washington, where we've got some brand new breaking new polling news on one of the most pressing issues facing our country right now, abortion rights. Ahead of the one-year anniversary of the landmark Supreme Court decision that overturned Roe v. Wade, 61% of voters say they disapprove of the Dobbs decision last year, which ruled there was not a constitutional right to abortion and left the legality of abortion up to individual states. 36% of folks approve of this decision. So who's in that 61% who disappro uh, disapprove of the Dobbs decision? 80% of those folks are female voters from, a from uh, ages 18 to 49. Two-thirds are suburban women. 60% of independents and even a third of Republican voters. So another way to look at this is for all the talk about how divided we are as a country, this issue, we're actually not that divided. There is a level of consensus because it is across the political divide. Anytime you get over 60% on anything in this country, that's closer to being consensus than divided. Also in these brand new NBC News poll numbers, 53% of voters say that abortion is too difficult to access across the country, even though a plurality, 43%, say that the state they live in has struck the right balance, but it's what they're seeing outside their state's borders. Since the Supreme Court decision, abortion access in this country has changed dramatically. In the last 12 months, nearly half of U.S. states have enacted some kind of abortion ban. 14 states have total abortion bans. Six states, including Florida and North Carolina, are caught up in court battles to enact more restrictive regulations. But new data shows that even in states where Republican-led legislatures have successfully implemented abortion bans, abortion itself is not going away. It's simply moving across state lines. Take a look at this analysis of where abortions have increased in the past year. Numbers have gone up in states that neighbor those with the most restrictive bans. It's why Ron DeSantis went back for a second bite at the apple when 15 weeks suddenly made Florida uh, an abortion sanctuary state. That's why he's trying to get it down to six. So some of those states have laws that are more restrictive than other parts of the country. Numbers have also risen in states like Kansas and Nevada where the right to an abortion is enshrined in their state constitutions. But the Dobbs decision changed much more than just abortion access. The ruling has impacted all of women's health care across the board as OBGYNs are feeling forced to leave some states. Just finding women uh, doctors uh, when they need them in some of these places is becoming extraordinarily hard to find. A new study by the Kaiser Family Foundation found that 61% OBGYNs practicing in states with abortion bans are concerned about the legal risks now associated with making patient care decisions. For our Meet the Press special that airs tonight right here on NBC News Now, my colleague Kristen Dahlgren explored the upheaval in women's medicine. Here's a portion of that report. More than half of the counties in Georgia don't have a single OBGYN. There was a shortage before the reversal of Roe v. Wade. But doctors like Joy Baker worry the state's strict abortion ban is compounding the problem. Anytime we limit access to full scope of care, we are limiting our patients and our practitioners. And when we do that, we, we may not understand the ripple effects. State Senator Ed Setzler wrote Georgia's HB 481, which bans abortion with limited exceptions after a heartbeat is detected around six weeks, often well before pregnant patients can get in to see a doctor. When you think about the telemedicine that's available, mm -hmm. you can have a doctor consultation. Um, those are th those are pretty broadly available across the state. But you couldn't have a scan to see if there were issues with the fetus. But I will tell you this, the LIFE Act balances the difficult circumstances. And I think the, the idea that there's ge geographic barriers for certain women in certain communities 
misses the point that there's a, a living, beating heart and a child that's, that's worthy of protection. Joining me now is Rachel Robine, reporter covering health and abortion rights for The Washington Post. And with me on set, Gabe Gutierrez, who's uh, covering the fight uh, on the 2024 race through, these days, the prism of abortion. Rachel, let me start with you. I think that's the big fallout one year later is the the unintended consequences, or maybe some would argue they were intended consequences, but the fall-on effect for women's health, for women that are trying to get pregnant, for women that have pregnancies that don't, um, uh, that that are that can't that can't come uh, finished to term. This seems to be perhaps what the uh, 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 the anti-abortion rights side didn't see coming. Um, and Chuck, first, thank you for having me. Um, you know, I, I think uh, we we did a big story. We talked to um, you know roughly 30, 30 people, and sort of we found several sort of big takeaways. Um, you mentioned that the study from KFF on OBGYNs. Um, one of the kind of the big takeaways that we found in our reporting is that abortion access has entered a kind of fragile new phrase, new phase here. And one year after the fall of Roe, you know, the full impact of the ruling is still being explored. It still remains in flux. Um, about 17.5 million women of reproductive age live in states where abortion is banned or mostly banned. As you mentioned, that is um, roughly 15 states. So, Rachel, I, I, so we had the fallout effect on, on OBGYNs. What, when it comes to more, what's the next? Are there, are there going to be more uh, in these states that have gotten rid of bans? Do we expect more attempts at even curtailing the ability to cross state lines? Um, or are some lawmakers realizing there's a big backlash against that? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think there's a few things that are looming large right now. One is the 2024 election cycle. There are um, abortion rights groups that are working to try and get abortion onto the ballot in states like Missouri and Florida. There's, of course, the 2024 presidential election. And something that we saw this year during state legislative sessions, particularly in Nebraska and North Carolina, among a among some Republican lawmakers, there was resistance to banning abortion um, early in pregnancy. Those two states enacted bans mm -hmm. at rough at 12 weeks in pregnancy. So we did see some backlash within the Republican Party. Um, mm -hmm. As you mentioned, that, that there were some states that still did pass uh, bans further in, right. in pregnancy, particularly Florida, um, which is governed by uh, Governor Ron DeSantis, now right. GOP presidential candidate. Right. In fact, let me bring in Gabe Gutierrez. He actually covers DeSantis for us. He's here because Faith and Family uh, is here, a big sort of a Republican cattle call of sorts of yeah. candidates. I think what's interesting is that abortion has divided this Republican field, mm -hmm. and we weren't sure how it was going to do it, but it really hasn't. And the candidate you're covering, he has decided to own the oh, yeah. six-week ban that is not in effect yet in Florida. Uh, yeah, that's right, Chuck. And as you said, Faith and Freedom kicking off just this afternoon. I was mm -hmm. there and spoke with several of the attendees, and they really like what they see from Ron DeSantis. No surprise, the six-week mm -hmm. abortion ban. And they see it, you know, he's going to the right of former President Trump. And DeSantis keeps bringing up this issue, too, that, you know, he'd do a better job picking Supreme Court justices, which is incredible when you he think about it. He thinks the Supreme it. Court is not conservative. Correct. That's exactly what he right. thinks. And he says that he would pick justices that are along the lines with Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas. And he actually try, is trying to make the case that the justices that former President Trump chose weren't conservative enough. That argument, though, and I spoke with several of the attendees, look, they think that former President Trump, to them, did an incredible job, as they see it, obviously, mm -hmm. because, you know, he helped overturn Roe v. Wade, but it's something that's coming up at this conference and will over the coming months. Well, that's what I'm curious about. Are they looking for an absolutist position on this? Or, you know, you have Tim Scott saying, hey, look, I'll, I'm going to sign what I can, but he's almost open to 
a federal ban being at 15 or 20 weeks, and 20 weeks to some might not seem like a ban at all. Look, and the question is how does this play in the general election, right? Mm -hmm. But the way the DeSantis team, from the conversations that I've been having, they are laser focused on this GOP primary. They are laser focused on right. Iowa, and they think that this position, this cons conservative position on right. abortion, they think it's going to get them there in Iowa. And then they'll worry about the general election, but they're not concerned about that at this point. So while some other GOP right. candidates may, you know, may be staking a, a different type of position, from the right. DeSantis point of view, he wants to go conservative, and he thinks it'll help him, especially among this constituency. All right. Uh, let me put a pin in this. I'm going to put you back to work in a minute here, Gabe. Rachel, I'll let you go. Really appreciate it. It's incredible work uh, you guys did at The Post. Uh, it was definitely uh, something we consumed very well here, so thank you for that. Uh, and let me bring in the rest of my panel. Lisa Desjardins, uh, correspondent for PBS NewsHour. Jen Psaki, the former White House press secretary and host of Inside with Jen Psaki on MSNBC. And former RNC chairman Michael Steele. He's also an NBC News political analyst. Um, Michael Steele, I want to start with you. We're not divided on abortion as a country, and yet our politics act as if we are. Right. At, at, at what point does the Republican Party... It, admit that there's a consensus here and they need to lean into it. Oh, they won't. I mean, to Gabe's reporting, they won't. I mean, it's very clear mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to pivot away from this. This has been a 50-year-long battle uh, that they uh, ostensibly won, all right, in one sense. But now moving from the idea that the states would control this conversation and they will decide individually, as we've showed in the, in, in the polling that you've done, mm -hmm. um, that's not enough. And the next piece now is, okay, we're going to broaden the lens out and we're going to narrow the focus. So we're going to broaden it out to the entire country, okay, and right. we're going to narrow it down to six weeks. Um, and you're going to eventually see uh, a situation, I think narratively, yeah. where they're going to talk about an absolute ban. It is illegal, zero, no weeks right. allowed. And that's ostensibly at the end of the day where they want to go. You know, Lisa, what I think has been remarkable, you know, there's some major stories that happen. And, you know, political strategists will say, oh, this will play one way or another voters, but the voters don't pay attention. I find it remarkable that voters are, they absolutely know what's been happening with abortion rights. Oh. They know state by state. I mean, they're very, we don't have a lot of don't knows in this point. Right. <laughs> well, are there any more political issues that are more firmly woven into our political fabric over the last 20, go back or to or Ronald Reagan. About our personal lives? That's though. right. I think that's that's what it right. Is, right. Exactly. Yeah. This, the stakes are personal. They're for your family. They're for people you know. They're for your church. All of that. I do think when I looked at the polling that you all did, something that popped out to me was that when you ask, is, your, is it too difficult? Is it too easy in your state? Almost no one has changed over the past year except there are more people by double digits who say it's more difficult in my state. Right. That is big for Democrats. It, it is huge. I mean, Jen, I mean, this yeah. to me, it's like I, you sit there and say, you know, people have this argument, does Biden really want to run against Trump? Mm -hmm. And it's like, does it matter? Is abortion Trump Trump? I mean, abortion is such has was such a driver, as mm -hmm. we all know, in the midterm elections. You think and bigger driver than the bad candidates? I suspect it was a bigger so. driver than we anticipated um, mm -hmm. and also than people probably gave it credit for. And, you know, I think Gabe very accurately portrayed the differences between the candidates. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter in terms of how Biden and the Democrats run against the nominee, likely Trump. But though Trump has not said he's for an abortion ban, he has bragged about his role in the Supreme Court and his role in, in the Dobbs decision. Mm -hmm. They will tie that around his neck. They will, but in a weird way, Trump is given so many mm -hmm. answers. And there's other ways that they run against That's Trump. But if it's any other candidate, abortion's the centerpiece of the election. Of course right? it is. And I think it is still a central issue with Trump as well mm -hmm. uh, because of his role in mm -hmm. the Supreme Court. We saw the polling that the Supreme Court mm -hmm. is at a 30 percent approval rating. All of these things. Women, many Democrats have kind of been awakened by mm -hmm. all of this. Um, and so my point is that Democrats, the Biden campaign, the DNC, if it's regardless, they're going to tie this issue to the Republican nominee and the Republican candidates. Gabe, okay, when you talk to some of these voters, do you get sense any of them going, God, I wish we abortion wasn't at the front and center? No, uh, at least the not, ones at, at this, con at at this conference. Yeah, but this conference. You know, this, this, as, you know, of this course. Is such but I'm a talking about places thing. like Iowa and some of these other You know, states. in Iowa, something that stuck out at me is when I went to some of the early DeSantis events, you know, and many other parts of the country, we talk about, you know, the, the ongoing feud with Disney. There, there's huge questions about how that's going to play politically around the country. But among certain constituencies in Iowa, among those evangelical voters, it spoke to them on a deep personal level, as you were discussing. What about Disney World? Was it? This no, was about taking this is about their culture. kids. Yeah. This yeah. they they this yeah. 
you know, they really looked at this at, from, at their core. This mm -hmm. is something that they responded to immediately. He got standing ovations when he talked about Disney. You know, it's not a business dispute for them. Mm -hmm. So for them, you know, those evangelical voters, they do see, you know, abortion a as a key right. issue. Now, the question is, you know, another place like New Hampshire, he didn't talk about uh, no, you know, abortion quite so much in New Hampshire. He's, but again, he's focused, laser focused on certain states, Iowa, South Carolina, tailoring his message mm -hmm. a little differently in New Hampshire. But for him, Iowa is huge. I have this thesis, Lisa, and I'll be curious what yeah. you think of it, that the rank and file Republicans aren't as strident on this issue as, as the activists are, and these politicians are playing to the activists. It depends on which rank and file. If you talk right. to, let's, I cannot there imagine many U.S. senators who are Republicans who want mm -hmm. to go to the right of Ron DeSantis yeah. on abortion. No. They don't. And Mitch right. McConnell doesn't want them to either no. because he wants to get the Senate back. The House conference is different for mm -hmm. Republicans. They are divided. There are some, there are dozens who feel that way. Probably a majority does not, but it is divided there. I, I, yeah, I could not agree more. And here's the X factor in all of this for Republicans. It's a state called Kansas. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, I think the activists and the party leadership and, and the Ron DeSantis's woefully underestimate where Republican women will line up on this thing when they get in the ballot box. Mm -hmm. When they get in that room and they're thinking about their daughter and they're thinking about their granddaughter mm -hmm. and the world they're about to create for them where their access to health decisions. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of these Republican women that I know that I spoke to, this was less about abortion. It was more about their autonomy to make a decision mm -hmm. for themselves, which the party has always argued. Well, and this is a bigger question I have for you, Michael, and Jen, I'm sure you want to comment on this, which is when you look at this by age, obviously, you want to talk about waking up an electorate, right? yeah. you know, 18 to 30 year olds, everybody says, oh, they don't actually vote. Well, they showed up, mm -hmm. right? They showed up in Wisconsin. I mean, this is a generational, this could be a generational mistake for the Republican Party mm -hmm. uh, if they're not careful. Like, all of a sudden, things could go off a cliff for them in about 10 years when more of these Gen Z voters are actively voting. That's absolutely true. And I also wouldn't underestimate people between 30 and 50 either. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a stronger voting block historically, but people are thinking about their daughters and the generation mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is coming up next, what the impact is going to be in states where they're living. Do I want to raise my daughter in Texas, for example? Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of Democratic, independent, Republican women might say no, because their rights are going to be restricted. So um, I do think unless they wind it back, and even in the Republican field, though, I will say, Nikki Haley clearly is trying to, like, skirt the way on this. Chris Christie, I mean, they're all Nikki a Haley bit... and Tim Scott strike me as whatever they think the audience wants to hear, yeah, they, they tell correct. them. Correct. And I like, you know, uh, yeah. we may have gone too far. I yeah. think they, they have that feel yeah. to they recognize yeah. At least they read the a room. I'll give them that. <laughs> they read the room. They recognize the politics of it. Super That's quick fine. note, though. I think that there is a young core of conservatives. We're talking about young voters yeah. overall do not want Roe overturned. Agreed. However, there is a very fervent, maybe more fervent mm. than we've seen in a generation, core of young conservatives no, who so are almost like reactionary. very anti -abortion. Point, yeah. yes. The Charlie yeah. Kirk crew. Yes. No, yeah. no, he has created. Yeah. It's yeah. a small but very loud bunch. I don't know how bunch. small it is. I don't know. Right. They're right. active. Fair enough. All right. Some of you are coming back. Some of you I'm letting go. Because uh, <laughs> some of you have other work. Something I said? No, 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 no. <laughs> no you'll find out in a minute. No. <laughs> As I mentioned, we have a lot more NBC reporting looking at the impact of Dobbs uh, on, on medicine, politics, culture, beyond. We have a, a terrific special we put together, Meet the Press special, Abortion in America, one year later. It airs tonight. 10.30 Eastern, right here on NBC News Now. Coming up, tonight's state dinner at the White House comes with a heaping side dish of friction as President Biden tries to balance what the U.S. needs from India strategically with India's increasingly troubling record on democracy and human rights. You're watching It's Press Now. Welcome back. You are looking live uh, right now at pictures here. This is India's Prime Minister Modi. He's addressing a joint meeting of Congress. It all comes after earlier today, President Biden welcomed Modi to the White House, where he is hosting him for an official state visit, an honor typically reserved for America's closest allies. The White House sees India as a key partner to counter China's growing influence, and today announced a flurry of new deals on semiconductors, space exploration, and U.S. jets. But the relationship between the United States and India is, in a word, complex. While the U.S. continues to arm Ukraine, India has yet to condemn Putin's invasion and not only continues to buy Russian oil, but has increased its intake of purchases of Russian oil. And there are also mounting concerns about the erosion of key 
democratic values and human rights in India. Modi's government has cracked down on political opposition and on religious minority groups, has even denied the ability of some people to run for office. Modi himself was once denied a visa to the United States over severe violations of religious freedom when he was uh, in a lower political office after deadly riots in his home state in 2005. All of this raises questions by some about why the White House is literally rolling out the red carpet for Modi, especially as Biden is le rhetorically has said he wants to make his presidency about the battle between democracy and autocracy. Of course, when you fifth spump MBS in Saudi Arabia, you kind of have lowered the bar these days. Joining me now from the White House is Mike Memoli, and joining me on set is Vikram Singh, senior advisor to the Asia program at the universe, uh, U.S. Institute of Peace and a former deputy assistant secretary of defense for South and Southeast Asia. Mike, let me start with you. This has basically been a 21st century uh, bipartisan effort. W, start, w, frankly, you can go back to the Clinton administration. Trying to bring India closer to the West has been a consistent across five, the last five presidencies. Obama did a state dinner. Biden's doing a state dinner for India. So, uh, but are we getting enough in return? Well, India has a real powerful seat at the table right now, Chuck, to be sure. And you put your finger on it, really, as you talked about the framing of President Biden's foreign policy, autocracies versus democracies. Well, India is on paper the world's largest democracy. And if you look at how President Biden has approached this tension, he has really tried to bolster and expand democracies, democratic alliances to counter both Russia's aggression with Ukraine and China's growing influence. India is really at the nexus of both of those challenges. And President Biden is trying to do everything he can uh, with diplomacy, with some of the deals that they're mm -hmm. announcing today to keep India in the fold. Now, it's important to note that India is also the host of the G20 summit in September. One of the big decisions facing uh, Indonesia last year was whether Vladimir Putin would be invited to attend as a member of the G20. That same question will be posed to Modi again very soon, uh, as that is another awkward potential moment. And just compare what we saw. With Mike, do we, are we asking Modi not to invite Putin? Is that, is that really a good idea? Well, what we saw last year was essentially Putin just said, I'm not coming because right. he knew there was such complications to it. And we took the heat off of Indonesia in that situation. You can be sure it hasn't really come up even in some of the preview calls, but that that's one of the conversations mm -hmm. that they're having behind the scenes right now about that. And it was important that when you look at the G7 summit that just happened in Hiroshima, India is not a part of the G7, but they were invited to participate. And we know who was the guest at the G7. Uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine. In right. that face-to-face -face meeting, the U.S. thought it was really important that Modi have that one-on-one -on -one right. meeting with Zelensky. He did pledge to do more to try to help Ukraine in this fight. So they're hoping that some of these deals they announced today, some of the uh, diplomatic flourishes, all continue to move Modi in the right direction, at least as it relates to Russia. They already yeah. feel like they're in a good place as it relates to China as a member of the Quad. Look, there's been a lot of theatrics to the day. There was the, one, the, the presser with, with President Biden. And look, I've been in plenty of those pressers. Uh, Democratic countries, leaders of Democratic countries usually call on their own press corps for a question. <laughs> Prime Minister Modi did not. Look, I, I saw that as a bit symbolic. thought it was interesting that President Biden called on all the questioners. Yeah, we, we don't. Uh, overlook any of these nuances as it relates to the protocols of a state visit. Usually it's a two and two. Mm -hmm. So the White House, up until the last minute, we didn't even know if there would be a press conference. Ultimately, mm -hmm. the compromise seemed to be uh, to just do a one and one. And one of the additional compromises was that Modi himself would not have to call on the wow. reporter, that President Biden would do it for him. It, it was notable as well to listen to Modi. He multiple times referred to our friends in the press. So he seems to be acknowledging the uniqueness of this uh, circumstance. Right. But the U.S. does consider it as they talk about always making human rights at the top of the agenda, no matter who they're meeting with, uh, that they were able to get him to a place where he did this today. Uh, they, they do welcome yeah. that. And uh, the question from the Indian reporter, maybe not necessarily on the nose about some of the challenges back home that I've been hearing a lot of protests about outside our window here, too. Do you get the sense that it was a friendly reporter at the White House, that they got a suggestion of who to call on? Well, it's not that they necessarily chose on a, a friendly reporter, but the topic uh, raised by that reporter certainly about climate change did not address the issues. Luckily, Sabrina Siddiqui of The Wall Street Journal did pose that question uh, to Prime Minister right. Modi, and he said democracy runs in our veins, so he tried to put the best spin on it. Fair enough. Uh, Mike Bemily, uh covering the White House for us today. Mike, thank you. Let me bring in Vikram Singh. Um,
Let me start right there. Look, for me, it's yeah. symbolic. You know, you have this question. I get asked all the time, how much is, 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 is India, you know, how democratic is it? How democratic is it? That is not an example of a leader that feels good about his press corps, which tells me you don't feel good about your democracy. So, I mean, India is a thriving democracy. At the end of the day, you can't deny you've got, it's the largest democracy in the world, somewhere near 70% of people vote. It's way easier to vote in India than it is to vote in the United States. Um, and uh, Prime Minister Modi, however, is not a leader that likes a lot of press conferences. He's not done a press conference basically in nine years. So this is Met not with a Elon Musk, small head of deal. Twitter yesterday. Met with Elon Musk, the head of Twitter. He's very active on social media. He engages publicly quite a lot, actually, right. through speeches, through rallies, through um, a radio address that's listened to by hundreds of millions of people. Um, sort of like it's fireside chat. A democratic but he is, president. Yeah. Authoritarian leaders do that too. He, they they do now. Is he authoritarian in the in the mode of a, of an Erdogan or mm -hmm. something like that in Turkey? Um, you know, probably not quite there. But India's democracy, you know, this is a state visit, and the reason it's a state visit is because it's about the relationship between the two countries. Right. The leaders of all democracies face challenges, and all democracies are mm -hmm. facing, uh, you know, increasingly challenges. Poland, Hungary, and Brazil, and I think we see that. In India, one of the challenges for U.S. presidents is: Well, are you trying to are you trying to uh, push back against those right. threats to democracy, or are you more a part of the of the challenge? And this has always been the sort of riddle of, of India. Here it is: the world's largest democracy. Why isn't it a closer ally to the United States? And and I would argue in the 21st century we've tried. Obviously, during the Cold War, India made a decision to be unaligned, I guess, but it it, it usually meant they were kind of winking and nodding with the Soviets, which is why we had the better relationship with the Pakistanis. Uh, yeah. For well, a time. well, let's let's but it's let's complicate. It takes it takes two to tango, yeah. right? So from the Indian side, they would say you guys tilted towards the Chinese, who had fought. We had fought wars with China already. We see China as a major threat. Pakistan is another threat. You went China, Pakistan. Right. It, we really didn't have a choice. So though they were not aligned, mm -hmm. um, they tilted to the Soviets. We tilted to the Chinese, and that went on through pretty much the so is this a, entire a Cold War. Of, we're finally at an enemy of our enemy is our friend now. It's, they're nervous about China. We're nervous about China. Maybe we can do business together. And I think it's a lot deeper than that. There is a there is a deep. In fact, one of the reasons I think you see so much criticism or concern about Indian democracy in the United States is there's some deep seated desire for the world's oldest democracy and the world's largest democracy to be these great partners and yeah. beacons to the world and sort of a symbol of the future. And honestly, I think we are. I think we still are able to do that. I think the 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 thing that changed in the 21st century starting with the end of the Clinton administration, was the Cold War was behind us and we realized, oh, we could start to build. But it's rebuilding. Like, we did not have this deeper relationship. Right. So when we look at why aren't they tougher on Russia, it's because of that legacy, because mm -hmm. of their dependencies on Russia that still continue, because of their 60 years of a strategic partnership with Russia, mm -hmm. that they're not just going to throw out the window. So we're not going to get them like an ally, like a European ally. They're going to be a friend and a partner. They're going to mm -hmm. generally be on our side of big strategic issues, but we're not going to approach things the same way. They want a permanent seat on the Security Council. And when you look at certain things, you know, you, you sit there and say, based on population, how do they don't? Africa doesn't have a single seat. Uh, no, no country in Africa when it comes to the permanent membership of the UN. Should that be, if the U.S. was the leader in trying to push for that, how much of a difference maker would that be in our relationship with India? It's been a consistent policy of the United States now for over 10 years. Barack Obama made it a formal position that we want India to have a permanent seat on the UN Security Council as a part of UN Security Council reform and modernization. Look, these are institutions, creaking institutions that are built, were built in the legacy of World War II. Mm -hmm. And they don't include a lot of the world. You mentioned Africa, South America. So the, are, are is not on the UN Security Council. The administration is announcing this week that they're going to have a major push to help India become a part, not just of the UN Security Council, but of the, the OECD, the European focus, do we make, APEC, another, another do we make global... India part of the G7? You know, there's a lot of talk about should there, the, be a the next G, G8? should there be a G8, a G9, a G10, you mm -hmm. know, potentially with some other partners. And you'll notice India was invited, as uh, your correspondent was right. mentioning, to the G7 this, this in Tokyo just now. Um, India has actually been invited regularly. They've become basically a fixture at G7 meetings. And I don't know if we're ready for a permanent expansion of the G7, but the yeah. fact that India is there, it's not just the United States. All the other G7 members 
also want India on their side of the ledger. So Modi's last trip to the United States when Trump was president, he did this huge rally in Houston. Yeah. And howdy very Modi. much the howdy Modi. Um, Modi really got along with Trump. Yeah. Um, why? I, I'm not saying he doesn't get along with Biden. I he think does. they have a good relationship, Great too. relationship. Um, but there seemed to be something that Trump really got along with him. What do you make of that? Uh, they're more populist. Mm -hmm. part, sort of populist leaders getting along with populist leaders. Biden's more of a traditional, uh, a traditional democratically elected leader. Yeah. Uh, and so that they all get along. Modi got along with Obama. And if you go back before yes, Modi, and Obama Prime got Minister, grief for that. Prime Minister Singh got along with Obama and got along with, uh, uh, with George Bush before mm -hmm. him. And Prime Minister Vajpayee, the Prime Minister before, got yeah. along with Bill Clinton and George Bush. We have had 20 plus years now of extremely good personal relationships right. between leaders of the United States. It does States feel like we're getting closer and closer to having this be a pretty tight relationship. This is a tight relationship. And it could be the defining partnership. They keep using those words, defining partnership of the 21st century. Why? Because when you step back and you think about the to be. big challenges, China, yeah. climate change, security, free and, a free and open Indo-Pacific, energy, technology, those are going to be things that really we do better if we do them with India. Uh, we can't afford in, to not have India on our side. We need them, we need them for the long run. Vikram Singh, thanks for uh, bringing your expertise. Thanks, Chuck. Up next, officials now say debris from that missing uh, submersible has been discovered, and it shows signs of a deadly implosion deep in the ocean. We've got the very latest next. You're watching Beat the Press now. Welcome back. We're also following the breaking news on the missing submersible vehicle that was carrying tourists to see the wreckage of the Titanic. The five passengers aboard the vessel are believed to be dead after what the Coast Guard is calling a, quote, catastrophic implosion. Earlier today, the Coast Guard said it found debris that they now assess is from the missing submersible. That debris, including the tail cone, was found on the ocean floor about 1,600 feet from um, the bow of the Titanic. In a statement, Ocean Gate, the company that owns the submersible, said, quote, these men were true explorers who shared a distinct spirit of adventure and a deep passion for exploring and protecting the world's oceans. Joining me now is our uh, correspondent on this story, Kristen Dahlgren, who's in Boston. So, Kristen, this was a multinational, an international effort, millions of dollars spent to try to rescue these folks. Um, obviously a tragic ending. What more are we learning about whether this submersible even should have been on the water? Right. I mean, truly a massive rescue operation has been, you know, m mobilizing over the past few days, including a vessel from France, from Canada, where it was initially launched from, also uh, from the United States. There were nine vessels in all that were involved in the search, two remote operated vehicles. One of those is what found uh, this debris field earlier today. Uh, they're learning more about what may have happened, and it looks like this catastrophic implosion uh, it, they're gathering happened very early on before this rescue effort was even launched because the Coast Guard said they've been listening over the past few days with these sauna buoys, and there was no sound that would have indicated any type of explosion. So they do believe that when that sub initially lost contact uh, on Sunday was around the time that it may have had this uh, catastrophic failure. They were asked about the investigation into the safety of this submersible. Over the past few days, we've been learning more from people who uh, had been on board or decided not to go on one of these dives, also some lawsuits against the company uh, where there were safety questions brought up. The Coast Guard said it's really too early for them to address uh, any type of safety investigation, uh, and that would be handled probably by a different agency anyway. So right now what they're doing is continuing the search for debris so they can try and figure out what happened. They'll begin to demobilize yeah. this massive rescue operation. But you're right, Chuck, there's going to be a lot of questions Ooh. about the dollar Figure, I was just uh, going to say, who, you know, this was who's in charge of this? dollars ticket, yeah. Who's in charge of this rescue operation? It's, it's been the United States Coast Guard that's been leading this unified command, and so everything has been run out of 
you know, right mm -hmm. here behind me uh, on site. The the um, company Ocean Gate uh, has been leading sort of the on site thing because they had the institutional knowledge of their own submersible and what its capabilities were. But um, you know, while it's been a joint operation, it's certainly been led by the mm -hmm. United States Coast Guard. And is there any so? Is it the Coast Guard that's trying to get the debris, or is it Ocean Gate? I mean, is the Coast Guard going to keep the debris for the investigation or not? Right. Well, and there's a question of whether or not they can even recover the debris. You know, we're talking about 13,000 feet uh below and so there are these remote operated vehicles and they did have sort of winches and the ability to maybe uh, hook to a submersible and pull it up whether or not they have you know the grabbers or the ability to get these mm -hmm. smaller pieces of debris this was a 22 foot vessel and so there it's in small pieces right now so unclear whether they'll even be able to recover anything Kristen Dahlgren uh, who's in Boston uh, where the Coast Guard has been running this rescue operation. Kirsten, thank you. Thank you for all your reporting on our abortion yeah. special as well, by the way. After the break, we now have a baker's dozen of Republican candidates running for president. As former Texas Congressman Will Hurd officially throws his hat into the growing ring of Trump rivals. He's lucky 13. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The House voted this afternoon to table an effort from Colorado Republican Congressman Lowen Bobert that was aimed at impeaching President Biden now uh, over his handling of the southern border. The move now sends the impeachment resolution to the Homeland Security and Judiciary Committees, allowing Republicans to avoid a messy intra-party fight right now over impeachment, though it's coming, because forces inside the Republican caucus are sure to point towards articles of impeachment making their way to the floor sometime this session. And with former President Donald Trump set to spend time in a federal courthouse later this year, an effort to impeach President Biden or DHS Secretary Mayorkas or FBI Director Christopher Wray could be the best televised counter-programming Republicans can offer. So back with me now on set, Lisa Desjardins, correspondent for PBS NewsHour, Naveen Nayak, President and Executive Director for the Center for American Progress Action Fund, and former RNC Chair Michael Steele, also an NBC News political analyst. Lisa, let's think about the last 48 hours okay. among House Republicans. You had Adam Schiff, Schencher. Mm -hmm. You had this attempt at impeachment, and then it was mm -hmm. moved over. You've got this weird fight between Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene. I feel like I'm leaving a third item out here. But there's clearly, oh, I know what it was, the, uh, the whistleblower, yeah. uh, the Ways and Means right. Committee today. Mm -hmm. There clearly are a group of House Republicans that really want to see if they can get Biden in right. some way. It I, I, looks like it's some sort of like revenge uh, for the Trump era or what it is. One of these is going to happen, isn't it? I'm waiting to see. There, there was a lot of calculation by uh, McCarthy's office over what would help them try and keep the House next year and when this timing could matter. When you look at the actual impeachment articles that Representative Boebert submitted that were sent to committee that all this whole fight is about, they're centered on immigration policy. Mm -hmm. So they, Republicans think that is a winning issue for them. However, if it is really just about getting Biden and not actually making the country better, they're, they're worried that that can expose them. And I, I, I'm not convinced yet that we will see quite the vote you're thinking we'll see. I, look, I don't, I don't see know. how this is good politics at all. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I'm, That's what I'm getting uh, at. That, no, but, exactly. but, but just yes. because oh. it doesn't look like it's a good idea doesn't mean it won't happen. But they still need the majority. Right. Right? Well, and they don't have those votes for this right the now. The question is, are, those, are there 25 Republicans comfortable voting against the base on this? Because I, I, I love what Kelly Armstrong of North Dakota said. This it's a terrible idea. He says, my constituents love it. Yeah, your constituents love it. But at the end of the day, it's just bad. It's not just bad politics. It's some of the dumbest politics you can come up with. There are a whole other cadre of things you can sort of lay out um, and using the committee chairmanships that they have. To, I got to an get, issue that I to, still... To get, to get it doesn't TV. make any sense to me. If I were, you know, we just had... A massive report this week about learning loss from the mm. pandemic. Yes. Last time right. I checked, the That's Republican right. Party was yeah. the party leading the charge against right. lockdowns. Yeah. 
This is actually I, that's could my be point. a policy argument. Thank they you. Have. That's they don't what know I'm how going. to do this. They don't, as Democrats don't know how to do communication, Republicans don't know how to do <laughs> policy. And, and, and that's the space the country finds itself in. You've got people who are out here not communicating the successes of the current administration, you know, infrastructure and inflation bills and things like that, where they got bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. And you got Republicans out here wanting to impeach a president that, yeah, maybe at 43, 44 percent, but nobody in the country is hankering for that right now. That's not where, where their interest lies. But there are lies. things that the public is but upset the, about. Thank you. There are yeah. things that the country is upset about that you could policy. <laughs> now, I mean, I mean would off. Democrats welcome an impeachment trial? I, I mean, mean, I know, I, 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 I just think that they don't, I mean, they would have to deal with it. Yeah. And it would fail spectacularly. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about welcome, because I actually think that <laughs> most of the Democrats want to legislate. They would sure. actually love, to, you know, it was a very productive two years, as Michael yeah. said. I, I think two things here. One is it keeps reinforcing the president's core message, which is sort of MAGA Republicans have taken over the party. And that mm -hmm. is what's happening there is a reminder of that. And they really have become a minoritarian party. And they are only governing for, at best, not even the 35% or whatever it is, to have, you know, they've abdicated the sense of leadership mm. that you are actually trying to drive your supporters to solutions and are just doing what they think the most rabid base wants. Lisa, I find it so interesting how often I hear a Republican member of Congress now say, like Kelly Armstrong, well, my constituents do want yeah. this. It's their way of saying, like, they'll ask them, what do you think of this resolution? Well, my constituents are really interested in this. It's their way of saying, yeah, I kind of wish we weren't focused on this, but I can't get caught saying this is a bad idea. And you know what's interesting about that? I was asking people recently, I'm, I'm, I totally agree with you. I'm fascinated by what people are he think they're hearing from their constituents. And I was asking members of the House Republican Conference, the Trump indictment, what were you hearing? They were not getting phone calls from their constituents, by and large, on that. But so there is a little bit of FOMO, I guess, among House Republicans mm -hmm. that like, hey, we want to prosecute someone. Lock her up. Lock him up. Lock That's them what this up. Feels like. That's what it feels like, I think. And I was just going to say, is there are there enough Don Bacons to stop it, Michael? Stop the impeachment process? Yeah. Yeah, I think there are. I'm, I don't think Kevin McCarthy in the main wants this to happen. I agree that he doesn't, but he doesn't, I don't know how he stops it. I, I think what I think he stops it the way he got he got some things done that no one thought he would get done on the debt deal, for example. I think he, he sort of pulls together the right mm -hmm. coalition of, of Republicans in New the York caucus. State. New York State, exa mm -hmm. exactly. To sort of sort of buffer this, I think that goes to the core of the whole Marjorie Taylor Green getting up in in Boebert's grill. <laughs> they're trying to, they're, they're well, mad at who gets credit. For well, it. well, they're not. No, it's not so much mad at who gets credit, but she's a little mini speaker. So Marjorie Taylor Green sure. is is doing the like you don't kind get to McCarthy, make this move yeah. unless we give you permission to make yeah. this move yeah. kind of move. And, oh, absolutely. Actually, I, th that underscores two things. Well, I actually think the problem is Kevin McCarthy would like this. He would just like it to be a little bit more baked. <laughs> yeah, I actually think that I think there's a we part of him that if he thinks it can help really him politically, he's ha he's right. not they focused. don't want to have this discussion right. in the middle of a presidential. He's not focused. The problem is he's not focused on solving problems. He's not focused on trying to get the caucus to bring actual legislation yeah. to the floor. And there's just a crisis of leadership in that party right now. All right, I want to bring up this Rick Scott. Oh, yeah. denial that he was really <laughs> yeah. this presidential stuff. Look, you don't normally see this out of the New York Times, right? <laughs> if Daily Beast sort of had thrown something like this and then yeah. he said, Rick Scott going, I don't know where that came from, you'd have been like, all right. Yeah. But, but it just seemed like an, either the what? Times was misled or some, yeah. something's... Uh, uh, but apparently the Times said he was thinking about running for president. Rick Scott says, I don't know what you're talking about, I'm running for re-election. But somebody is trying to mess with Ron DeSantis. Oh, I think that is very, That's what very this clear. About. Yeah. I will also say Rick Scott is an ambitious person, you mm -hmm. know. So was he in a conversation sometime somewhere? He's a U.S. senator. Yeah. Of course he thought about running for president. Yeah. But is he really? No. No. I will say this. There's a lot of bad DeSantis stuff that's showing up in the news. I think everyone is trying to mess with I'm Ron DeSantis. Saying, DeSantis is, is wishing he never fired Susie Wiles. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, Lisa, Michael, Naveen, thank you all. Still to come, the former chief of staff to the nation's top cyber defense agency weighs in on the fallout and potential ongoing threat posed by last week's global cyber hack. That's right. You might have missed that one after it targeted the federal government. You're watching Meet the Press now.
Welcome back. It has now been a week since we first learned of a massive cyber attack that targeted several federal agencies. The government says the attack, which it blamed on a well-known ransomware group, was widespread and likely impacted private companies as well. It's the third time, at least that we know of, that hackers have been able to infiltrate federal agencies in as many years. And it comes amid growing concerns by security experts that hackers could have their sights set on next year's election. I'm joined now by Kirsten Todd, who served until April as chief of staff to CISA, the federal agency that oversees cybersecurity. She's also a former executive director of President Obama's Commission on Enhancing cyber, National Cybersecurity, essentially helping one of the architects of the current system that we have now. Kirsten, it's good to see you. So let me just start with um, uh, the, the ransomware group. Do we think this is an independent group, or do we think they have a, a state sponsor? Well, it's great to be with you, Chuck. Uh, so I think the first, what you're referencing is this ransomware group, CLOP, which uh, is a Russian uh, ransomware group. We don't know if it's state-sponsored, but right now there's no evidence of that. What they did, you're talking about the, the Move It application. It's a managed file server application. And what this means is it transfers data. And so what they did, uh, the ransomware group, is they exploited a vulnerability uh, whereby the data that was static in the app was exploited. So if your data was on the file server at the time of the exploitation, mm -hmm. that's obviously concerning because uh, that data was exploited. But what's important is that it's static. This is not something that we see as a systemic risk. Uh, this is something that happened, and quite frankly, CLOP probably didn't even realize uh, how much uh, data it was going to get across government entities and private organizations. And what we're seeing right now well, what is do you that think their initial motive was then? Attacked. I'm sorry? What do you think their motive was? So I think, you know, these ransomware groups are just going after, uh, they're going after data. Uh, they're just trying to go stay below the radar. But I do think, you know, when we look at this and we're talking about the concern, uh, the actual event that happened last week that's also, it's more concerning, is the hack of the Barracuda appliance. And so what you're talking about here is the concerns for uh, what's being exploited. And this is believed to be uh, a China uh, hacker uh, state-sponsored group that went after Barracuda appliances. And the challenge here is that we believe it's been done for espionage purposes. So what we're seeing, obviously, uh, the Russian mm -hmm. uh, hacking effect is really we're seeing just probably as a ransomware uh, event. But this Barracuda, uh, which is uh, China-sponsored, is uh, much more concerning. Well, so what, look, this has been the, um, you want to talk about uh, the paranoia that some people have, the, inter the Internet of everything. So the idea that you can hack appliances and use it for surveillance? Is that what we're what you're saying? So uh, Barracuda does email uh, secure. It's an email security gateway. Mm -hmm. And so what be is believed to have happened is that they exploited a vulnerability. Mandiant came out with this report last week. Uh, it is very concerning because we there's a belief then that this uh, potentially is state sponsored by China and that it is being done for espionage purposes. And so now we have to really look at how do we help remediate um, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency uh, put out an advisory, uh, certainly for Move It, and they're working on you know being able to help entities remediate and be able to patch and do these things quickly uh, so that we can mitigate the impact. The espionage of uh, anything that's coming from from China is certainly of concern. Uh, this February, uh, the IC put out an annual threat assessment that was very explicit about uh, China mm -hmm. having the capability to attack our critical infrastructure if it felt that the United States it was going to get into conflict with the U.S. So while we are concerned about Russian ransomware groups and mm -hmm. what's going to happen, certainly our priority right now uh, is being able to keep our critical infrastructure safe and secure against uh, any sort of state-sponsored China activity. Look, bigger picture, I how concerned are you on a day-to-day -day basis that that the state-sponsored uh, espionage has sort of, you know, has already infiltrated and we don't know it? What's the likelihood of that? I think we can always assume, uh, we, we've always had the assumption that uh, we have uh, espionage on our networks. It's, it's a tool that is used globally. The concern right now, and we always are concerned about vigilance fatigue, uh, we know that we have heightened tension uh, given the situation with China and Taiwan, and cyber, cyber tools are an effective tool for uh, engagement, and it's a tool that China will use. So what we need to do right now is critical infrastructure needs to double down on its resilience, needs to double down mm -hmm. on its safety and security. It's challenging because we just came off of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where we asked companies to uh, fleet up to what we called at CISA shields up, uh, right. this idea that you've got to do more. And we're heading into this other phase where we're very concerned about China. I, I want to well. talk about that as a, as a as sort of, you know, a little feather in your cap there, because... 
you know, we, we never report that another plane lands safely at National. The, the dog that didn't bite on the Russian invasion of Ukraine was all these cyber hacks that we were all petrified of. Um, what is, what should that, should that reassure us that we, we are at least more vigilant than ever? I think it's it's a great point because, you know, having done this since terrorism, you never see the, the attacks that don't happen. Right. Um, it is very much about resilience. And I think this is really a story about industry and government working together, real time information sharing to say you need to do more and industry responding and respecting what government said, because government has earned that respect, which has been, you know, mm -hmm. a, a very a long journey, but it's there now. And I think when we have something where we're concerned, when the uh, 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 intelligence community comes out right. to say we should be concerned about China's presence on infrastructure, that industry will respond appropriately and be able to to yeah. fleet up and have that vigilance. Look, I think it's it's always you never get patted on the back for stopping an attack nobody knew was going to happen. But uh, I do think it's one of those things uh, we need to remark upon. Uh, Kirsten Todd, cybersecurity expert, uh, former government official assistant. Thank you for coming on, sharing your expertise. Good to see you. Great to see you, Chuck. Thanks. And thank you all for being with us this hour. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. And one more reminder, don't, don't miss our Meet the Press special, Abortion One Year Later. Here's tonight at 1030 Eastern, right here on News Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.